Okay, so water conservation for eastern United States for a lot of people is not high on their their list. But at some point we're going to get there. We're going to get to the point where we're going to have to actually um, have some kind of conservation um, and ex especially recycling our water stuff like that. We can reduce our bills by doing such. Now where do you get your water from? Now this is something that a lot of people don't understand. Most of the time when I, they say, well where do you get more water from? Is like, well, I, pull, I turn on the faucet, right? Well where does that water come from? Where does the water from your faucet come from? Now it really depends upon where you live in the state. Uh, here in North Carolina, if you're here in North Carolina, if you're in other places, you're going to have to figure that out for yourself, and that's part of your discussion this project this week. Um, but in the state of North Carolina, it, it depends on what part of the state you're in. If you're if you're in the Appalachian region or in the Piedmont region, you're probably getting your water from surface water. About 85% to 90% of the individuals who are actually live in those regions get your water from some kind of surface water source. And that surface water, when they get it from that surface water source, they, the individual will actually, uh, or the water company, will actually treat that water, um, clean it up um, if there's any um, contamination or anything like that, um, put uh, put it through the system, and maybe store it up in a, a wire tower or something like that. Some places have them, some places don't, depending on where you are. Um, and then they'll distribute it out to the customer, right? Then after that, you can then have what we call a waste stream that goes the same way back to the sewers that goes back to our treatment plant, which then actually puts it back into the water supply. Okay. So, for example, any water from um, Cape Fear, so up near Raleigh, they mostly get their water from Jordan Reservoir and some of those other reservoirs up there. Um, that water um, will be used and then put back down into the system. Um, in some cases, into the PD or into the Cape Fear or something like that, depending on which which part you're in there, um, and then that water will go downstream. So the water that we, for example, we in, in, in Fayetteville, those that live in Fayetteville, you get your water from um, the Cape Fear. Well, that Cape, that water also from up in Lillington and up near um, the Dunn area and further south up also get their water from the Cape Fear, but uh, they put their waste right back into it. So you're in, in Fayetteville, you're actually drinking the water that has, has been the waste from other individuals in the past. Well, what, I'm, what I mean by that is that waste has been cleaned. It's actually been clean enough that you can put it back in that water supply. Right? They've gone through and treated it to, 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 to have that occur. And so because of that, uh, the water we're having is often clean, usually clean. Now there are some times where you can have spills. For example, right up near um, near Fayetteville, up near K in the Cape Fear um, River, there was just recently a spill called the Gen X spill uh, from Kimmore. It's a, it's an actual chemical treatment plant, and they have an effluent going into the river that they are supposed to treat. Well, what happened is some of, they had a spill where some of their material was not treated properly, and it went back into the river. The river that then actually went into the groundwater as well. So there's some it's contamination there that's just recently occurred. And there's individuals in that region that are being impacted by their water supply. They don't have a clean water supply for right now. For example, I have a really good friend that he's, he's on drinking water. He's on, sorry, bottled water. And he can't use his water from his well, from his pump, uh, because it's contaminated with that Gen X. And there's, it's cancerous material and stuff that they don't want to drink from right now. So that could have a huge impact on them. They, they're probably going to be on uh, bottled water for the next six months at least until they can get some of that cleaned up. And it takes a long time and hard to clean that stuff up. So anyways, now if you don't get it from a surface water supply, you're probably getting it from a groundwater supply. And if you're living in the, in the um, coastal plain of, the, um, of North Carolina, you're probably getting it from groundwater. And from this case, we're pumping it up out of the ground, treating it in a lot of cases, and then going to the storage. Now, sometimes we don't need it. Groundwater tends to be fairly clean. And so you don't often, for example, I have my own um, groundwater well. And so I don't even have to treat my well. I actually pump it up, and it's clean enough that I can actually go straight to my house, and I don't have to actually go through the other steps of storage, right? So some of that actually is... Um, is already clean water. However, if it goes through a public supply source, for example, if you live in the county here, you don't have your own well, you're probably getting water from the county, uh, and that water is treated first. Iron's removed from the water or something like that so that they, they will supply the water to your um, 
your either your work establishment industry or even your home, right? So we actually, our department actually works with the Robinson County um, Groundwater District to be able to monitor the groundwater in this region. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about groundwater. But that's where you guys get some of your water if you live from around here. If you're here at Pembroke, you're actually getting your water also from groundwater and getting it from um, wells pumped right down near the Lumber, Lumbee River. It goes down into what we call the Black Creek Aquifer. We pump it out and actually put it through the system here in Pembroke. Um, here on campus, we have 11 different wells. And the wells are, on campus are not drinking wells. They're, they're what we call irrigation wells. And so, But we get our water here at Pembroke from um, the pump Pembroke water supply, where they have their own wells and own storage um, in our region. Okay. So that's something that just kind of to think about. You've seen these storage tanks, these sort of water towers all around, and that is a part of your water supply. So let's now we've got to out of that idea about water. Well, let's, what happens to water when it actually goes downstream? And this is where we're going to have the, the vast majority of our discussion here. So we've talked about um, the environmental issues re regarding water and some of the, the, the environmental justice issues regarding water and environmental impacts. But now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about what we call fluvial processes, which is, is when water hits the ground, what happens to it then? There's two things that can happen, remember. It can either infiltrate into the ground or it could flow on the surface. And so what we're going to talk about is how it flows on the surface and how it impacts the ground or the geosphere when it does, when it flows on that surface. Okay, so when you think about this, there's two forces at, at, at play here. There's the heat from our planet that's actually causing the, the water to move around our planet and actually terrain. That's one thing that's actually driving the system. And the next thing that's driving the system is gravity. And that when the water falls down, it's falling down to that, that um, gravitational force or the gravitational um, driver, which is coming down to the Earth, and then it flows downhill from there, going from high elevation to low elevation, right? And so the driving force in, in, in most river systems is gravity. It's, the, it's the, the, the propelling of that water or that mass down the slope to the ultimate um, basin, which is what we call the ocean, right? So however, there's resisting forces along this way. So as the water goes down, it actually is going to interact with the soil, with the rocks on the, on the substrate, and therefore it will slow down, or you'll have friction um, along that. Okay, so that was resisting forces as it flows down the river is your friction between the water and the channel boundary. Now, what we need to also define something. What is a stream? Now, when people, when people say stream, what they often will think of is a small little creek or a small little flow, flowing body of water, right? Well, the scientific term of a stream is actually more than that. A, uh, for example, the Mississippi River is a type of stream. The Lumbee River is a type of stream. Okay, the Black Creek, which is just to the north, uh, north, east, if you, west of here, is actually um, still a stream. Okay, in the scientific term, a stream is a body of running water that is confined to a channel and moves downhill under the influence of gravity. So a canal is actually a stream if you have water flowing down it. Okay, by by strict definition. Uh, however, a lot of people locally call different streams different things. So they call it a big stream, like a, the Mississippi River. They call it a river because it's larger. Whereas you might have a, a smaller stream, which is, doesn't have as much water flowing through it, or a creek, which has even less water flowing through, through it. Uh, other places, people call them um, a brook or something like that. So there's lots of different uh, uh, local colloquiums that actually have different terms for, for, these, for these things. Okay. But scientifically, a stream is anything that has any body of water that's moving down a channel due to the, the, the influence of gravity. Okay. Now, when we think about a stream also, you have to also think about velocity and the velocity of the water as it goes downstream because that velocity is going to impact the friction along that bank. right? And that's the, that's the resisting forces that we're talking about. So the fastest part of the water column as it goes down a stream is the center here. And that's the place where we have the least amount of friction, where you're gonna, it's going to be deepest, okay, and then we have the least amount of friction with the surface of the, the boundary of the, um, the channel or the, the area at the top. So this is what we call the thaw wag. The thaw wag is the deepest part of the stream channel where you have the maximum velocity. So I'm a kayaker. I like to kayak, and I like to kayak down streams and, and stuff like that. So let's say if I had a race with one of you guys, and I actually were to, to uh, race down the, the stream, 
I would want to get into what we call the thou the thawig um, as much as possible because that's going to give me uh, more of a boost because that's going to be the, where the fastest water is going. And I'm going to get want to get my um, my oars down into that thawig as well because it's going to give me an extra boost forward as I as I go through it. So if you look at this, if you have a channel right here, like the cross section B, it's going to be right here in the center where you have the deepest part of that. Okay, but notice you have. Because of the momentum of the water, most of the water is going off to the right. We need the fastest water off to the right and slower water off to the right. Okay, so on th this sense, though, you're going to go on the outside corner, you would actually get more, higher velocity water than going on the inside corner. So even though you go on the inside corner, you have less distance to actually travel. The velocity of the water is faster on the outside, so you'd want to take the outside corners. Okay, instead of the inside corners. Now, if I were to go upstream, I'd want the slowest velocities. In this case, I'd probably want to go on the inside corners, right? Go on the inside here, inside here, taking the shortest distance possible. It's because that is where you're going to have, um, where you're going to have the low velocities is where you're going to have deposition. Whereas you have, you have the fast velocity, that's where you're going to have erosion. Okay, the faster the velocity, the more friction you're going to have, the more erosion of that bank you're going to have. Whereas if it's going slow, the water is not fast enough to, to move the bigger particles, and so the, the particles are going to fall out. So we have deposits forming on the edges that we call point bars. And then the, the outside where you're going to have an erosion is what we call the cut bank. Those are two terms that you should remember. Okay, a point bar and a cut bank. Okay. Okay. So there's two sources of water in all of our streams. There's either, we've already talked about it a little bit, there's what we call the surface runoff that comes off and goes into the stream, or we have groundwater, where it infiltrates down and then slowly will go back into that stream again. And to be honest with you, the vast majority of the water that's in the stream has actually at one point been groundwater. So it will actually flow down and then pop back up into the stream at some point. So if you go down to the Lumberry River, you might have what we call springs, where it's where the groundwater is actually coming back up into the river and then actually putting more water into that stream. Okay, so a lot of that water at some point was underground and is now flowing on the surface. So how do these streams form? Well, first what happens is the water itself will actually fall on the land. And when it does fall on the land, it will now start to actually, the things that don't, the water that doesn't, excuse me, infiltrate into the ground will flow on the surface. Initially, it will flow as a sheet, what we call sheet wash, okay? Okay, and it will slowly go down, but then it's going to start to actually um, get itself and focus itself into a channel, okay? A small little channel. We might have a new channel that starts to form. Maybe we often call them rills, okay? Where that will come down through there. And then over time, those rills become bigger and bigger to form a bigger channel until we get what we might call a tributary, which is a, the stream here with the small other channels coming in are what we call tributaries. Tributaries are, are contributing water to the stream. Okay, That's why we, if you think about the word tribute, like in, like in uh, what's the, the movie, uh, The Hunger Games, where somebody was giving up this tribute, right? It's giving something up to a bigger cause. In the case, in the case of The Hunger Games, it's giving one person up to the capital, right? Okay, for those who remember that, uh, that, that show. The same thing here is the water from one channel we're going to go into another channel. So it's the tributary of this bigger stream. Okay. So what we call these things, or what we call this, this, this is drainage basins. A drainage basin is in an area that if the rain falls, all that water is going to go down into a central channel, in a case a river or a stream, and then go down and then feed into another tributary downstream until you get the main trunk of the stream that then goes out into the ocean. Right. So, for example, here is the Yellowstone River drainage basin. This is where, near where I grew up. I grew up on the other side, on, over here on the Idaho side, over here. Okay, let me see if I can get my laser pointer here. Okay, I, I grew up right over here outside of Yellowstone. And if we went over to, to the closer to Yellowstone, we're up on what we call a ridge or a drainage divide. Um, where if the water were to drop on that ridge, part of it would go into one drainage basin and the other part would go into the other drainage basin. That's what we call a hydrologic divide, a ridge dividing one basin to another. For example, the continental divide is a great example of this, uh, where it splits the, cap the continent in half, where some of that water goes to the Pacific and some of that water goes to the Atlantic. Right? We have a similar thing here in the, the, the Appalachian Mountains, where some of that, if it was to drop, fall on the Appalachians, some of it would go to the Atlantic in this area, and some of it would go down to the Gulf of Mexico through, through that region. Well, 
The Yellowstone River drainage basin is one small basin of the Missouri River basin.